Okay, so today's topic is going to be looking at the intersection of depressive syndromes and uh, schizophrenia symptoms. The, historically, I'm going to talk about why we tend to view these two things as uh, relatively separate, and I'm going to point out some areas where that um, notion of separateness might be not as founded as we would perhaps think of at first appearance. Uh, and we'll, of course, uh, look, at the, look at the impact of antidepressant treatment and schizophrenia care. So let's talk about this separation between um, so-called mood disorders and so-called you know, persistent psychoses um, in the beginning that was given the name dementia precox, and then uh, it was rechanged. It was changed to schizophrenia. Um, but the, but who, whoever did the naming, um, it, the, the, the important point is the psychiatry version 1.0 consisted of long-term care asylum, you know, type hospitals, and the physicians in those days, their primary task was categorizing illness. Uh, so I like to say we've been practicing psychiatry for about 150 years, most of it without medication. And during the early days, and by the early days, I mean like the first 75 years or so, uh, the, we, were, we got a lot of information about natural course of illness. Um, and so those, you know, those early uh, founders of the field, um, looking at things like the tone of the symptom, is this something that is sad? Is this something that is related? Is it something that is suspicious? So looking at the, the nature of symptoms and looking at simply time course, is this, you know, when do people tend to become ill with this kind of symptom? Um, does this persist? Does this remit and so forth? Based upon those very kind of um, naked eye obvious and intuitively obvious um, markers, came up with the idea that we have mood disorders in the one hand and uh, eventually we would call those depressive disorders and manic disorders. Um, and then on the other hand, we would have uh, psychotic disorders, nowadays called schizophrenia. Um, but I just, I put this little illustration at the lower right corner um, because this is a model that actually was dominant in human understanding of the universe for almost all of our existence. And it was so well entrenched that you actually would get persecuted um, if you were to propose that the sun is the center of the, the, uh, is the, center of the solar system. Um, and the, the, the little more or less story is that what seems obvious to us based upon our sort of human understanding and unaided observations might not necessarily be the way that nature herself organizes her things. Um, so let's look at some reasons to think that maybe depression and schizophrenia might not be as separate as we might be led to believe by, um, by convention. So first of all, there is the symptom overlap. I mean, I was doing, I started doing PANS uh, questionnaires and PANS scoring, and I was, I found myself when I got deep in, deep into PANS questions, uh, wondering what really is the difference between negative symptoms and depression. Um, the, when you do PANS interviews, you'll ask questions that to me sound a lot like depression screens. Do you have low energy? Do you, fly, do you feel yourself unable to experience pleasure? Um, do you have social, with, social withdrawal? Uh, is your range of affective expression to my eye uh, reduced? Um, so, you know, those are, those are, these bullet points represent key defining features of negative symptoms, but they're also key defining symptoms of depression. The only thing lacking between this negative symptom description and a diagnosis of depression are thoughts of death or suicide, or perhaps a, uh, you know, a, a cognition that involves a sense of worthlessness or hopelessness. Uh, but the, um, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of the primary um, neurovegetative symptoms, there's this significant overlap in symptoms. Um, there's also this thing uh, about, you know, uh, cognitions. So in, in, in psychiatry, classically, we define delusions as beliefs that are fixed, that are relatively unchanging to external information, and that are false. Um, in depression literature, we have this thing called cognitive distortion. Um, Aaron Beck himself, the father of, of CBT, describes a case of a successful businessman who started many companies, employed thousands of people, uh, made lots of money, um, and he tells his psychiatrist, I have accomplished nothing in my life. Um, and so, you know, um, 
his psychiatrist would try to say, but look, what you've done, and the guy would say, oh, it's nothing. So there's, um, you know, in, in this juxtaposition, I would say the only major difference between delusions and cognitive distortions are whether they are bizarre or not. Um, so there's a, there's a something to the, you know, something to thinking of, uh, of the more severe cognitive distortions, the more deeply held ones, as bordering on delusion. Um, that might explain why antipsychotic drugs tend to have a signal for improving the efficacy of antidepressants. Um, nobody actually really has a great explanation to explain the kind of reliable observation that uh, antipsychotic drugs, when co-prescribed with antidepressants, can help people who have had marginal response to antidepressant have a more pronounced response to psycho to pharmacotherapy. Um, and conversely, as we'll see in a couple of slides down the road from here, uh, there's also a signal in the literature that says that if you, if you treat somebody with schizophrenia with standard antipsychotic drugs and they don't have a full response, um, and then to that person you give adjunctive antidepressant medications, um, a good many of, of individuals will have a further reduction of their, uh, of their schizophrenic psychopathology. So we can use antidepressants and antipsychotics in the treatment of depression, and we can use antipsychotics and antidepressants in the treatment of psychosis. So another example of some um, treatment overlap between the two. Let's talk about genes and look at genetic overlap. I'd like, to, for those who aren't familiar, I'd like to introduce you to a thing called the schizophrenia polygene. Uh, the illustration you're looking at came from Nature, and the uh, citation is at the bottom of the slide, hyperlinked for your convenience if you want to read the original paper, which is open source. Um, what you're looking at is called a Manhattan plot. And the Manhattan plot gets the name because they say, you know, it kind of looks like the skyscrapers of a skyline of a city. Um, on the x-axis, you see a range from left to right chromosome numbers, starting with chromosome number one, ending with chromosome number 23. Um, so that's basically a map of the human genome on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the frequency of association between specific genes on those chromosomes and the occurrence of schizophrenia. So um, the red line, the red horizontal line uh, toward the bottom of the figure is the cutoff for statistical significance. And because we make hundreds of comparisons, the threshold for deeming something significant has to be extremely low, like um, 10 to the minus ninth power or something, of p, p to, the, to the minus ninth power. Uh, so there's a you know, strange, so nonetheless, um, above the red line are genes, and there are uh, 128 of them in this plot, which show association with schizophrenia. So uh, many genes, hence polygene. This is the picture of schizophrenia genetics. Um, it's not one gene, it's 100 genes, uh, each of which confers some degree of risk to schizophrenia. Uh, the, taller the, the taller the building on the Manhattan plot, the stronger the association. Um, and the point of showing you this is basically to say there's a lot of genes. The point of the next thing is that many of those genes are actually shared between people with schizophrenia, people with bipolar disorder, and people with major depressive disorder. So the idea that bipolar, major depression, and schizophrenia are distinct differences, distinctly different illnesses, is not so clear as the DSM might lead you to believe because there is pharmacological overlap, there is symptom overlap, and there is a considerable genetic overlap. Um, these are correlation coefficients between genes shared with schizophrenia and bipolar, or schizophrenia and major depression disorder. Think of these R values as, as akin to effect sizes. So the effect sizes of 0.7 and 0.5 are significant. So um, you know, it's a stronger association, more shared genes between bipolar and schizophrenia, but also a significant association between of shared genes between depression and uh, schizophrenia. So genes say maybe not as distinct as we would imagine. And this very, this, I'd like to introduce you to this very interesting gene um, called DISC1. DISC1 stands for disrupted in schizophrenia. Um, and the DISC1 gene was found in a Scottish pedigree, multiple generations uh, in this family, in this extended family, um, had many different types of severe mental illness. And uh, the, the diagnoses according to best criteria available would be would, would span would span the DSM, schizophrenia, bipolar, depressive disorders, and so forth. Um, and it turned out that there was this, there was a mutation in this uh, in this gene which got the name 
just one. Uh, and that single mutation can have a variety of associate, uh, can associate with a variety of different behavioral phenotypes or DSM diagnoses. Uh, interestingly, in animals, if you, if you insert the mutated disc one gene, uh, you will see a variety of different behavioral outcomes and which behavior you get as a result of gene insertion depends upon environmental conditions. So disc one is a very interesting gene whose product clearly, at least in animals, has uh, an ability to mediate environment and behavior interactions. And the human data would suggest that as well. So one gene does not necessarily correspond to a specific symptom as we human beings have traditionally um, recognized them. Uh, so now turning the attention to pharmacological overlap, uh, I alluded to this earlier here, we're going to look at some um, evidence that antidepressant drugs probably are helpful for many people with schizophrenia. Um, this paper, I actually don't know if the whole thing is open source or not, but the, the hyperlink at least takes you to the abstract. Um, Corel and, and, and his collaborators uh, got a whole bunch of data on a whole bunch of drugs that are not antipsychotic drugs, but were nonetheless added to antipsychotic treatment in, the, in schizophrenia care, and did a meta-analysis as best they could with the data for each drug type. Uh, the bottom line here is you're looking at uh, table one from their study, which looks at the effect of the various drugs on the left column of the table on the ability to reduce total symptom burden in people with schizophrenia. Uh, the most effective, uh, or the drug with the highest effect size, drug class with the highest effect size, were serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, like venlafaxine, for example. Uh, the next one were noradrenergic, noradrenergic serotonin-specific agents. Uh, mirtazapine would be an example of that kind of drug. Um, so the yellow highlights are antidepressants, and the p-values for the association are on the far right. Um, so it, the point of this is that many antidepressant species um, seem to be helpful in reducing total symptom burden. Uh, if, we, if we look specifically at the negative symptoms, um, again, the antidepressants highlighted in yellow on the left um, show a signal for um, further improving efficacy. And uh, again, the SNRIs, uh, prototypical agent being the vaccine, lead the pack with an effect size estimate of about 1.4, which is yeah, actually not too shabby. Uh, the limit of this meta-analysis is that the number of studies available are relatively small, um, but there seems to be a consistent signal for antidepressants um, creating some further benefit. Uh, then we have another way of looking at the role of antidepressants in schizophrenia care is, uh, is this study by Tihonen et al. Um, they utilize Scandinavian data, which is a beautiful thing because every single person in Sweden has a unique number, which is applied to all services one receives. Um, and with, with, um, with ethical oversight, it's possible to then enter into their centralized medical records and know who has what diagnosis, who uses which medications, who lives, who dies, who goes to the hospital, and so forth. Um, so, so extracting uh, data on, on tens of thousands of individuals from the Swedish registry, um, Tihonen et al., I'll direct your attention to the middle column of, of graphs, looked at the effect of antidepressant exposure on mortality. Um, the top row of panels is for overall mortality. Middle row of panels is for cardiovascular mortality. And bottom row is for uh, suicide mortality. So the, the summary for this busy slide for this lecture is that antidepressant exposure um, ha it's, it, it has a small but significant effect on reducing overall mortality. Probably that effect is mediated uh, significantly by reducing cardiovascular mortality. Um, you'll see that the green boxes tend to go up, um, you know, above, above one suggesting that antidepressant uh, use is perhaps associated with um, higher risk for suicide mortality. However, the black bars are confidence intervals, and those all touch the zero, uh, touch the touch the one line. So it doesn't meet quite statistical significance. Although it's um, uh, the the trend looks like it might eventually make it. Um, presumably, the answer to that uh, riddle is that antidepressants are being prescribed for depressive symptoms. Um, but the 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 uh, the middle, the middle graph shows you know, a clear with narrow confidence interval 
um, signal for antidepressant exposure, reducing cardiovascular mortality. So um, the bottom line, they seem to be uh, useful at mortality reduction. So to summarize this short presentation, um, it can be easy to overlook or not recognize depressive symptoms as people with schizophrenia. Uh, we're trained to think of depression as this thing that people without psychosis get. It looks like I'm a worthless person and, and um, I have low energy. Um, we don't actually have a book that describes what depression might look like through a psychosis filter. Uh, so it may be easy to miss. It may be also easy to um, be confused between what is depression and what is negative symptoms. Um, it's important, I, I think I've said this in previous lectures, but I'll mention it again in case there are people who are new. Um, it's important for us as prescribers to always remember that our drugs for treating schizophrenia work by blocking dopamine signals. And dopamine is an important neurotransmitter in the nucleus accumbens reward circuit. So we have the ability through our prescribing to create um, apathy and uh, decreased reward signal. Um, th these are called technically secondary negative symptoms. Uh, so when looking at somebody who's talking about um, feeling flat, uh, feeling low motivation and so forth, uh, keep in mind the pharmacotherapy and particularly the dose of antipsychotic drugs. We can often um, help reduce that, uh, that particular kind of symptom by, um, by lowering the dose or by using gentle doses of protopaminergic drugs, such as imantidine. Um, antidepressant medications do appear to reduce overall symptom severity, appear to reduce negative symptoms, and appear to reduce mortality. So um, I'm not saying that everybody with schizophrenia needs to be on an antidepressant medication, but uh, clearly many of them would benefit from such medication, and hopefully you'll have now some understanding as to the rationale for that kind of prescribing.